So thanks, Rose. And um, yeah, as I was saying before, um, thanks to Rose, uh, Peter, and Jim for organizing uh, the seminar series. I, I've missed uh, many of the talks, but I, I've seen them on, on YouTube uh, afterward, and uh, they've been really great. So, um, so thanks for that. Um, so also, before I start, I should give a warning that um, David spoke about this work um, at the Oxford Discrete Math and Probability Seminar at the end of May. And um, I think one day before the talk, he got an email from Kevin Hendry uh, saying that he had read our paper and he didn't understand uh, one step in the proof. And there was a good reason. Uh, it's because um, there was a mistake. So. Um, so in case you were at David's talk, um, I think he had some caveat of, well, you can listen, but it could be that everything I say is, is totally wrong. Um, but I'm happy to say that uh, in the meantime, we've been able to um, fix the bug. And uh, so we should have the archive version updated um, by next week. So in case you're at David's talk, I, I should have some, some new stuff for you. Uh, I'll try to say um, exactly where the mistake is and, and how we fix it. Okay, so let's start. Uh, so this talk is uh, sort of at the intersection of extremal and structural graph theory. Um, so let's start with some extremal stuff. Um, so this is Turan's theorem. Uh, Turan's theorem is about uh, the maximum number of edges you can have uh, in an n-vertex graph um, that doesn't have a clique on r plus one vertices. Um, and this number is TNR, what is that? Um, that's the number of edges uh, in the Turan graph. Um, so in the Turan graph, what you do is you've got a graph on n vertices, you break it apart into r sets as equally as possible, and then you put all edges between um, different parts. So a picture will make everything clear. Um, this is the Turan graph on eight vertices broken up into three parts, and I put all edges in. Um, so this is the most number of edges that you can have on an eight vertex graph that doesn't have a K4. Um, so I've written the theorem in a funny way with this maximum number of copies of K2, uh, just to stress that um, many problems in extremal graph theory um, can be phrased as counting copies of subgraphs um, in another graph um, in some graph class. Um, so you might think I'm kind of cheating because counting edges is not really counting subgraphs. But there is a, a beautiful extension of Turan's theorem um, called Zykov's theorem, uh, which is about counting copies of Ks uh, in a KT-free graph. Um, and the answer turns out to still come from the, from the Turan graphs. So for example, this graph has the most um, triangles as well um, in an eight vertex graph that doesn't have a K4. Um, okay. So we want to do something slightly different. Um, so we want to bring in structural graph theory. So, um, so for us, a copy is a subgraph, not necessarily induced. And this graph class that we're, we're counting um, subgraphs in um, will not come from forbidding an induced subgraph, um, but it'll be uh, coming from a minor closed class. Um, in particular for, for graphs that embed on the surface. So this is, this is our main question. Uh, let me move this guy. Um, so our main question is, I give you a fixed graph H and a fixed surface sigma, and I wanna know um, what is the maximum number of copies of H uh, in an n-vertex graph that you can draw on sigma without crossings. Um, so let's call this, uh, this number, this extremal function, C, H, sigma, uh, N. Okay, so we weren't the, the first people to think about such problems. There, there are results uh, in this vein. 
mostly uh, for the plane, so when sigma is the sphere. So let me just briefly review those. Um, so this is subgraph densities in planar graphs. So probably everyone knows that um, a planar graph on n vertices has at most um, 3n minus 6 edges. So this s naught is, is the sphere. Um, so the answer is also known exactly for the triangle and the four cycle. So it's those numbers, 3n minus 8, 1 half n squared plus 3n minus 22. Uh, the answer is also known exactly if you want to count copies of k4. And it's also known exactly for the path on four vertices and the five cycle. Um, so all these results are, are exact. Um, so what we want to do is to sort of get a theorem that uh, includes all of these results. Um, but I mean, some of these things are, are pretty subtle theorems. Uh, um, so we want a theorem that works for, for all graphs and also all surfaces, um, but we can sort of only hope to get the answer within a constant factor. Um, so here is a theorem sort of along the lines of what we want, um, so for the sphere. So it says that this extremal function um, is linear uh, if and only if your graph is planar uh, and three connected. Um, so this is almost an answer um, along the lines of what we want. So it says you've got linear growth if you're three connected. It doesn't say what the extremal function is if you're not three connected. Um, so that's, that's something we also want. And we also want to extend this to, to all surfaces. Um, so once you move to uh, an arbitrary surface, um, this H can now be uh, a non-planar graph. So uh, this is our main theorem, which basically solves the question for all surfaces and, and all graphs. Um, so it says that you pick your favorite graph H, your favorite surface sigma. Uh, it turns out that this extremal function uh, will always just be a polynomial. So it'll be n to the f of h, where f of h uh, is some graph parameter, which is called the flat number uh, of h. So uh, I should stress that the flat number is just a graph parameter, so it doesn't depend on the surface. Um, so the surface actually doesn't play a role except for um, in this hidden constant term. Um, so the answer will always just be n to, to the flat number. Um, so I'm not going to tell you what the flat number is quite yet, um, but let's start with um, thinking about graphs with flat number zero. Um, so, uh, so if you believe this theorem, these are precisely the graphs where you can only embed, uh, so n to the zero is just a constant, so these are precisely the graphs that you can only um, get a constant number of copies uh, in sigma. So, uh, so certainly if you're a graph with flap number zero, you should be not planar, right? Because if you were planar, I could just take a bunch of, um, of disjoint copies um, and that, that would give me many copies of H in sigma. So you should definitely be not planar. Um, and okay, so the question is, is that, is that sufficient? Does anyone, does anyone want to answer in, in the chat? Okay, so I will, I will answer my own question. So no, it's not sufficient to, to just be not planar uh, because you might just be the disjoint union of a non-planar graph with a planar graph. And then you can you could do the same construction where you just take um, disjoint unions of, of the planar part. Um, so here is uh, the key definition that sort of generalizes that construction. Um, so uh, a flap 
of your graph is a small order separation. So it's a, at most two separation where uh, one side is planar. Um, so this A plus, I'll say what that is uh, in a second. So for us, uh, a flap will always have the, the left side of the separation being planar. So let me just remind you that a zero separation is just, um, well, a separation is just two subgraphs uh, whose union is uh, your entire graph and its order is the number of vertices in which uh, these subgraphs meet. So here I've drawn, uh, I, have, I guess you can see my hand, right? Okay, so this is a zero separation, um, this is a one separation, and this is a two separation, and for, for this talk, um, you don't need to know what a three separation is. Uh, but you do need to know what this A plus is, it just means that in case you're a two separation, you add that edge um, between the vertices on the boundary. Uh, and if you're a zero or one separation, uh, A plus is just, is just A. So a flap is uh, a low order separation where one side is planar. Uh, Tony, and, I've got a question. Uh, do you assume that either side is connected? No, the, the only thing that we need is these are proper separations. So there has to be a vertex here and there has to be a vertex here. Um, but these guys aren't necessarily um, connected. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so that's a flap. And now that you know what a flap is, I can tell you at least what flap number zero is. Um, so flap number zero means that you're not planar and you have no flaps. Um, so this is stronger than being not planar, right? So you're not planar uh, in any way that you kind of split the graph into two small parts, uh, one of the sides will be planar, right? Um, so now let's prove our theorem for flap number zero. Um, so one direction is easy. So suppose that you don't have flap number zero. So this means that, um, well, okay, you could be planar. <laughs> so of course, if you're planar, you have more than a constant number of copies, but you could have a flap. Um, so here is sort of a proof by picture um, that you don't have a constant number of copies uh, in sigma. So. Um, let's consider um, this graph, which is just K5 with an extra edge hanging off. So this graph does not have flap number zero because um, this is a flap, right? So this edge is, uh, is planar. Uh, we, we, at this point, we don't know what the flap number is, uh, but we do know that it's not zero. And the claim is that um, the number of copies of this guy in the torus um, in an n-vertex graph, uh, I can make that uh, linear in n, right? So here's how I do it. Um, I just, first of all, draw k5 on the torus. So this is, this is the torus. This picture means that um, uh, I've identified these opposite sides. So it's like Pac-Man. I can go in here and then come out on this side and I can go in here and come out on the other side. So this is a drawing of, of K5, um, just in white. And then what I do is I look at where this vertex is, and then I just put a bunch of um, copies of this yellow edge uh, inside that face. Um, so now what I've done is I've made linearly many copies of this graph because every yellow edge together with the K5 uh, gives me a copy of this K5 with an extra edge, right? And you'll see that um, it doesn't really matter that um, I just have a single edge here. Any planar graph would suffice. I can just stick, stick this, pla this planar graph or many copies of this planar graph inside this face. And it also doesn't really matter that um, it's a one separation. Uh, so you can do this trick for, for two separations. Um, 
So one direction is easy. If you don't have flep number zero, um, you actually get at least um, linearly many copies uh, of your graph H. And now let's try to prove the hard direction, which is if you have flap number zero, um, you can only get at most a constant number of copies in the surface. Um, so this will already have um, a lot of the, the key ideas for the, for the general case. Um, so let me um, go through the tools that we need. Um, so this is just to remind you the theorem that we're, we're trying to prove. Uh, you've got a non-planar graph with no flaps. Uh, I want to prove that uh, in every surface, you can only um, get a constant number of copies uh, of H. And this constant will depend on, on this graph H and also on the surface. Okay, so I guess I should be a little bit more precise about what a surface is. So a surface is just something that locally looks like the plane. And I'm just going to define them via the classification theorem. Uh, so for us, a surface is, um, so you take a bunch of, uh, of tori and you glue them together. So here I've taken two of them. And then what you do is you cut out um, a bunch of open disk. Uh, so here I've cut out uh, three open disk. So now the boundary of these disks uh, is just uh, a circle. And so what you can do is um, you can take a Mobius strip. The boundary of a Mobius strip is also a circle. So you can glue this Mobius strip onto, uh, onto this disk. Uh, and the thing that you get is what we call a surface. Um, so that's all you need to know about surfaces almost. Um, except for there's an important parameter. Um, so this is sort of the right um, way to measure how complex the surface is. Um, so this topological variant is the Euler genus. It's two times the number of handles plus the number of uh, Mobius strips that I've glued into the surface. Um, so for this guy, it is uh, two times two because I have two handles and I've got three cross caps. So this surface has Euler genus seven. Okay. So you only need to know, I think, two things about surfaces in this talk. Uh, one is that you cannot draw a K3T uh, if T is big on, um, okay, so, so, so sorry, I should say that, so this is the Euler genus of a surface. The Euler genus of a graph is just um, the smallest Euler genus of a surface um, that you can draw the graph on uh, without crossings. Okay, so, um, so you need to know two things about surfaces. Um, the first is that um, you can't draw a K3T uh, on, uh, on a surface of Euler genus G if T is big, uh, where uh, big means 2G plus 3. So you know, I can't draw K3 comma 2G plus 3 on a surface of Euler genus G. Um, and the other thing you have to know about surfaces, so this is kind of the only topological fact you need to know, is that um, this Euler genus is additive um, across uh, small order separations. Um, so this is actually kind of not trivial uh, to prove. Um, so it, it just says that if you've got two graphs that meet um, in at most two vertices, then the Euler genus of the big graph uh, is at least the sum of the Euler genus of the two smaller graphs. Okay, so this is this is all you really need to know, and this sort of shows why you should actually work with Euler genus instead of of genus. This is this is not true for for genus. Um, okay, um, so another tool we need is the sunflower lemma of. Uh, Erdős and Rado. So there have been some um, recent improvements, actually, for the bounds that you get in the sunflower lemma. But that's not really important for us since our, our constants are so bad um, that um, it, does, it doesn't really help much. Um, but what is the sunflower lemma? It says that if you've got um, 
many sets, it doesn't really matter what this many is, uh, of bounded size, then you can find a subfamily um, that has a very sort of controlled structure. So this subfamily is called T sunflower. So what is a T sunflower? This T just means that you've got um, T sets um, and they intersect very nicely. So what it means is that you've got T sets, all of whose pairwise intersections are the same. Um, so here I've drawn uh, an eight sunflower. So I've got eight sets and all of these sets intersect in this white set here, which is usually called the kernel of the sunflower. So the sunflower lemma says, if you've got many sets of bounded size, you can find a large uh, sunflower. And we want to apply the sunflower lemma to copies of H uh, in G, but the thing is, uh, copies of H and G have a, a bit more structure than just the structure of a set, right? So uh, these are actually subgraphs of G. Um, so we can think of them actually as um, labeled sets where I label um, these vertices according to uh, which vertex of H they come from, right? So, uh, so the, the subgraphs are actually labeled sets and um, this notion of coherence is another way that we can clean up um, uh, copies of H, right? So, so this notion of coherence says that, um, well, a, a coherent family is, um, is controlled in the sense that uh, each vertex is used in at most one way, right? Um, so a picture will kind of make this clearer. So here I want to look at copies of the three vertex path uh, in, in G. So I can consider that as, uh, as a labeled set where I label it according to the order along the path. And um, I don't want to do things like factor out by isomorphism. So we know that if we switch uh, one and three, I get the same graph, but I'm really considering one to be different uh, than three. And this family is coherent if uh, each vertex is used in the same way by all copies of H. So here I've drawn a, a coherent subfamily or a coherent family of copies of the three vertex path. So if I look at this vertex, it always appears as the middle vertex of, of the paths, right? So, um, so there's a nice lemma of David Epstein um, that shows that um, if you've got a large collection of uh, subgraphs, um, you can always find uh, a large coherent subfamily. So the bound is actually kind of similar to uh, what you get in the, in the sunflower lemma. So we'll, we'll actually use um, both of these lemmas. So we'll use the sunflower lemma and this coherence lemma. So the bounds get, uh, get quite, quite bad. Um, okay, so now we're ready to, to do the proof. Uh, so let me just remind you, this is what we're trying to prove, that if you've got a graph with flap number zero, um, you always just can get a bounded number of copies uh, in, in sigma. So, um, so what we can do is, let's suppose we've got a bunch of copies of H uh, in sigma. Um, so if I apply both the sunflower lemma and this coherence lemma, it means that I can find uh, a large sunflower, which happens to be coherent as well. So large means that it has 2G plus three sets. So here it is. Uh, so this is a proof, I guess, for G equals one for the, for the projective plane. Um, so here I've got this large uh, coherent sunflower. So again, this picture means that um, I've got five sets and they all intersect in this white set here and it's coherent. Um, so that means that if I were to draw H uh, in, in each of these sets, it would look exactly the same way, right? 
So what I do now is I imagine what happens if I delete the kernel uh, from each of these copies of H. So I, I imagine deleting the kernel and that might break up um, these guys into components. So maybe I get two components. And again, by coherence, it means I'll also get two components uh, in all of these copies because they look exactly the same. So now let's focus in on one of these components we get after deleting the kernel. Let's call that C. And again, C also appears in, uh, in the rest of these copies uh, by coherence. Uh, so now what I do is I look at the set of neighbors of this component uh, in the kernel. So I look at this yellow set here and I'm a broken record, but um, by coherence, um, the set of neighbors of this green guy is also this yellow set down here, right? And so now uh, all I have to do is ask myself, well, how big is this set of neighbors? So could it be that there are at least three vertices uh, in this set of neighbors in the kernel? So I claim that the answer is no, uh, because what I can do is I can delete the rest of the components. And these guys are our components, so I can contract them um, down to a single vertex. So let's do that. And here I get a copy of um, a complete graph. And you just have to remember one of the two things you're supposed to know about surfaces, which is that uh, you can't embed this K3 uh, 2G plus 3 on a surface of Euler genus G. So this is, this is not possible. So what it means is that you've got at most um, two neighbors in the kernel. Um, and I claim that this is also uh, impossible. So here is where we have to use that um, H has flap number zero. Um, so if you look at this component together with these two vertices, this gives you um, an at most two separation of H, right? Because this blob together with the kernel and the rest of the components uh, meet in at most two vertices, um, meet at most this set here. Um, so remember that this, our, our graph H has flat number zero. Um, so it means that um, this graph here should be uh, non-planar, right? So, um, so again, by coherence, that is also true for the rest of these copies of H. Um, so what I've now found is a bunch of subgraphs on the surface that are not planar and that meet in at most two vertices. Um, so now you just have to remember the second thing you're supposed to know about surfaces, which is this additivity of Euler genus. Um, so this is also a, a contradiction, right? Because the number of guys that I have here is, is strictly more than G, right? Um, so if you were paying attention super carefully, uh, <laughs> you should note that it's not necessarily this graph that's not planar, but I might have had to have added that edge in. Um, but that's not really a big deal because um, you can always add uh, a handle to your surface and draw that edge in, right? And that only increases the genus by two uh, and two G plus three is still bigger than, than G plus two. Okay. Um, Right, so that, that, that finishes the proof um, for at least for flap number zero. Um, so I guess we've reached the point where I should tell you what the flap number is. Um, okay, so if we go back to this example where I was able to build um, literally many copies of this graph, um, so the question is, well, what should flap number two be? Well, there should be some sort of independence between the flaps, right? So 
So for flap number two, I'm supposed to be able to get quadratically many copies uh, of H. So I should be able to kind of do this flapping operation uh, independently, which means that my flap should, should sort of be disjoint in, in some sense, right? So, um, so here is the, the precise definition. So let's say that um, two flaps are, are independent. Uh, the following two conditions hold. So remember, a, a flap is a at most two separation where the left hand side is the planar part. Right? So two flaps are independent if the planar parts are edge disjoint and they are vertex disjoint in, in this sense. So it, it means that um, you shouldn't have a vertex that's in the interior. So it's it's in the it's an A1, but not on the boundary of A1. And it's an A2, but not on the boundary of A2. So there shouldn't be a vertex that's uh, internal to both of these planar parts. All right. Um, so I should say that um, these conditions are independent from each other. Uh, so neither actually implies the other. Um, so here's an example, a silly example, where I just take uh, H to be a bunch of isolated vertices. And so if I do that, clearly the flap number should be the number of vertices, right? Because um, that's the number of copies I can actually get uh, in, in the surface. Um, and so, um, but this graph has no edges. So of course, like all the flaps that I draw uh, will be edge disjoint, there's no edges. Um, so you really need this, uh, this edge disjoint condition uh, for this example to make the flap number seven. And here's an example to show that um, you really need uh, this condition as well, right? So here I've got uh, a six cycle and its flap number should be three, if you think about it. Um, but uh, if I didn't have this edge disjoint uh, condition, um, so here is a flap, it's given by this degree two vertex, and here is another flap, it's given by this degree two vertex, and these two flaps do satisfy this condition, actually, right? So, um, so they have a vertex, uh, in common, but um, this interior vertex is on the boundary of the other separation. So th this condition is actually satisfied for these two flaps, um, but they're not edge disjoint. So they have this, this orange edge uh, in common. So you really need um, both of these, um, of these properties and they're exactly the properties you, you need uh, to prove the lower bound. So, um, Okay, so here is the flap number. So, let me see. so the flap number, uh, there are some degenerate cases. Um, so, um, so it could be that you don't have any uh, low order separations. Maybe you're a three connected graph. And uh, if you're three connected, your flap number is going to be one if you're planar and it should be zero if you're not planar, right? So. So if you don't have any low order separations, your flap number is one if you're planar and everything else is covered um, with this definition. Um, so otherwise, um, the flap number is just the maximum number of pairwise independent flaps, right? Um, so this notion of independence is uh, precisely what we need um, to uh, prove the lower bound actually. So here is, um, here is a proof by picture of the lower, of the lower bound. So, um, so this is our graph H, uh, right? So what this picture means is, so imagine that this yellow part is planar, uh, this green part is planar, and this blue guy is just some highly connected um, non-planar graph. So this graph, uh, has flap number two, right? So this is a flap and this is a flap. And my claim is that I can make uh, quadratically many copies of this graph um, on, uh, on any surface. 
So what I do is, so it's quite easy to show that um, this yellow guy and this green guy are actually connected uh, because if they weren't connected, you could actually find two flaps uh, inside here, um, two independent flaps inside here. And that would mean that the flap number is actually three instead of two, right? So, um, so there is a path uh, in the yellow guy between these vertices and there is a path in the green guy between these vertices. So, uh, so what I'll do is I'll embed this non-planar graph uh, on, on my surface together uh, with, an, with an edge uh, on, on the boundary vertices. And this graph I can draw on my surface because it's a minor of this graph, right? So what I do first is I just embed this graph on the surface. And now what I do is I just look at a face that contains this yellow edge. And inside this face, I, I just do this, this flapping operation. So I just put um, copies of the yellow guy uh, inside inside the face. Right? So um, so that's this is what I've this is what I've done here, and uh, I also do that for the for the green guy, and now I get quadratically many copies uh, of this graph because um, let's say there's about n over two or some constant times n yellow guys, some constant times and green guys, each of these copies and each of these copies gives me uh, a copy of, of my graph H, right? So the lower bound is quite easy. Uh, it's, this is, it's the same proof uh, for arbitrary uh, flap number, proof by picture. Uh, how am I doing on time? Okay. Um, it's the upper bound that's, uh, that's tricky. So let me, at least give some some ideas. So so far, uh, everything I've said is true. <laughs> so there hasn't been uh, we haven't reached the the mistake uh, yet. Um, so, uh, but we're 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 approaching the mistake. So um, so to prove the the upper bound, what uh, what we want to do is to go by induction on the flap number, right? So. Um, so what we need is uh, some operation um, that that reduces the flap number. Um, so let's let's consider uh, some examples. So let's let's think of a path on on six vertices. So this path has flap number three. I've drawn three flaps. There's a red flap. There's a green flap, and there's this blue flap here. And I want to, to uh, reduce the flap number by uh, sort of eliminating one of these flaps. Um, so what you could try to do is, is to say delete uh, one of these flaps. Um, by delete, I mean remove all the vertices that aren't on the boundary. So suppose I deleted uh, this red flap here. Well, unfortunately, if I do that, it turns out that I have a graph that still has flap number three, actually, right? So, um, so these things are flaps, but there's another flap decomposition which has three flaps in it, actually. So this thing, uh, I can take this leaf edge, this leaf edge, and this this uh, two edge path to be my third flap. So what I really should have done was to delete um, this blue flap here, and if I do that. I get down to uh, a graph that has flap number two, right? So the moral of the story is that you should somehow delete maximal flaps, right? You can't just delete a flap and, and, and always reduce the flap number, um, but you should take a flap to be uh, somehow uh, maximal. And this, this will actually always work uh, for one separations. But there is a problem if you do this um, for two separations. So let's consider um, the six cycle. So the six cycle has flap number three. Um, so again, um, you get three flaps by just considering these, um, these two edge paths. So all of these are two separations. 
and these flaps are, are clearly independent. And clearly, I mean, this is like a packing of, of flaps, right? Um, so these flaps are, are actually each maximal. Um, so they are maximal, but if you delete one, um, you actually don't reduce the flap number, right? Because what you've done now is you've introduced um, these degree uh, one vertices. So this graph actually uh, still has flap number three. So you've got um, two flaps that come from these leaf edges and this two edge path, right? So the way to fix that problem um, is to add the edge uh, along the boundary, right? So it turns out that if once you add this edge back in, this decreases the flap number actually. So this five cycle now just has flap number two, right? So, so the moral of this story is that uh, with the notation uh, we introduced earlier, um, you should use this B plus instead of B. Um, so it turns out that if you do um, both of those things, um, so if you take a flap where uh, A is as big as possible, so as big as possible means that um, there is uh, some collection of K independent flaps where this flap is in it and uh, A is as, as large as possible under the, the subgraph uh, relation. So if you do that and you replace your graph with B plus, so you just delete A uh, and you add that edge uh, along the boundary in case it's a two separation, then you do end up with a graph that has flap number uh, one less, k minus one. Sorry, okay. can, I, can I just ask you, uh, if you start out with an odd cycle, yes, don't you end up with an even cycle one shorter? No, so if, so if you take uh, an odd cycle, so let's, let's even use this, uh, this five cycle here, right? Uh, so this has flap number two, okay. And with this maximality property, uh, what I would be forced to do is to take um, this three edge path as my flap because um, there is another flap that's disjoint from it. Um, and that's as big as I could go. Like I couldn't take a, a four edge path because then there wouldn't be a, a flap that's disjoint from it, but I could take a three edge path and then once you um, uh, do this, this plus operation, you get a triangle and a triangle has flap number one um, because it's, it's three connected. Well, it's not three connected in distal sense, but for the purposes of this talk, it's uh, three connected. Um, okay, so we've reached the point of the talk where uh, we made our, our fatal error. Um, so in our old proof, we, we basically had kind of completely forgotten about um, this, plus, this plus notation. So when we went to do uh, the inductive step, um, we basically assumed um, that this extra edge uh, really is there. Um, but, but this extra edge doesn't necessarily even exist in H, right? Um, so the thing is, we're not totally screwed. So the thing that sort of saves us is that uh, even though this edge doesn't exist, it is true that there is a, a path in, in A uh, between the endpoints. Um, so the way that we fix the proofs is to sort of um, work in a framework where um, some edges are fake. Um, so some edges aren't really there, but we remember that um, there, is, there is this path that's floating around uh, in H that certifies that that edge is, is there in some sense. Um, so the proofs become a lot more complicated uh, because we have to sort of work with these virtual edges. Uh, but the fix is to kind of just do all of our old proofs um, in the framework of graphs with, with virtual edges. Um, 
So um, let me at least give some um, some ideas of the of the inductive step. So this is sort of a fraudulent uh, proof sketch. So what we do is we apply this this flap reduction lemma to lower the flap number uh, by one. And so now by induction we know that. Um, there's n to the flap number of one minus one copies of, of this guy. Um, so again, this B plus is not really going to help us for the real proof because um, this edge doesn't necessarily <laughs> even exist uh, in H. Um, uh, but anyway, but and then now what we want to do is to prove that when I put A back, uh, there's only linearly many ways uh, to do that, right? Um, and so let me at least sort of quickly say um, how we do this last step, how we do this, this third step. And um, the way we do this third step is to use the SP guard tree um, of A, of the flap that we've reduced on. So I'm not going to tell you exactly what the SPQR tree is, um, but it is sort of, it's a generalization of the block cut tree um, of a graph. So it's a tree that displays all the, at most, uh, two separations uh, of your graph. Uh, and sort of the key idea behind it is, well, right, so if your graph is a cycle, um, you've got a lot of two separations that cross. So here is a six cycle, and here is a two separation of the, of the six cycle. Here is another two separation of your six cycle and these separations cross. So you cannot really display them uh, in a tree because trees sort of display non-crossing separations. Um, so the fix is just to say, well, let's just allow uh, a node of the tree to be a cycle. So, so the SPGAR tree of a cycle is, is just a single node uh, where you remember that uh, it comes from, from a cycle. So it turns out that if you do this, you you get a nice uh, you get a nice tree structure, um, and we uh, use this tree structure to do this last step, right? So um, okay, maybe I'll just kind of go over this part. I, I should be finishing rather soon, right? Okay, uh, I take silence to mean uh, yes. So Two minutes or so, yeah. Oh, 10 minutes. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, uh, so anyway, you don't really have to read, uh, read all of this stuff. Um, this is just um, the setup where I've reduced uh, on, on some flap. And uh, so it turns out that once you do that, um, you can look at um, where in G, um, the boundary vertices get sent to. So that's the set X here, right? And it turns out that um, the structure uh, of this planar part um, is quite nice. If you look at the SP core tree of, uh, of this A plus, you can prove quite easily that it's a path actually. Um, and in order to prove that there's a linearly many ways to, to put A back, uh, I use the SP guard tree to find uh, a, a magic uh, edge. So the magic edge here is this X prime. Uh, and this, this magic X prime has the property that if I also fix X prime, um, I get a constant number of copies of um, of A plus, right? So if I fix X and X prime, I, I get a constant number of copies. And um, the reason that's true is that for each of these vertices, uh, it turns out that you can always find um, three internally disjoint paths from this guy to X union X prime. And so if you could prove that, then uh, you, just apply the sunflower lemma um, like we did before, and you'll be able to find um, this K3T minor. So that, that's how we 
prove this, uh, this linear, linear number of ways to, to put A back. Um, okay, so let me kind of quickly say also that uh, we have some, some more precise results for cliques. Um, so here is just one of them. Uh, so, um, so for cliques, we just get much more precise answers. So for example, for K4, uh, I, uh, we know that K4 has flap number one, it's planar and it doesn't have any, uh, any flaps. So we know the answer is linear, but we just get much more precise answers. Um, so we get um, this, uh, the answer is basically N plus this G squared term. Um, and okay, so we get this extra factor of g to the 3 over 2 additively, but these numbers are, are almost the same, actually. And we have other results for triangles and, and larger cliques um, that are just more precise than, than what our main theorem says. Um, oh, right. So, um, okay. Um, so minor closed classes. So it turns out that things are actually kind of easier for minor closed classes. Um, so let's define the, the flop number. So that's, a, that's an O, not an A. So the, so the flop number of a graph uh, is just the number of uh, independent uh, at most two separations. So this is, this is even actually easier um, than the flap number definition because I don't care whether uh, either side is planar or not planar, right? And um, if you just run our proof, um, you actually get something for minor closed classes where you replace flap number with flop number. Um, so, um, so, uh, so here the certificate, uh, the minor that we find is this K3T that we found in our proofs anyway, right? Um, so in some sense, things are easier for, for minor closed classes, actually, the proof, the proof is, is easier. Um, so let's, let's go to some, uh, some open problems. Um, so what you might hope to do now is to generalize to higher connectivity. Um, so here there's a two. Uh, so I consider this to sort of be the two flop number. Um, but you can do this for uh, higher uh, constants. Um, so let's define the S flop number to be the maximum number of independent at most S separations uh, of your graph. And we conjecture that um, this should actually give you the answer uh, in mind closed classes where um, Instead of a three, you get uh, an S, an S here. So you should always have this thing to be one more than um, the, the, the low order separations that you're considering. So our conjecture is that um, this should give the right uh, exponent uh, in, in minor closed classes. Um, so things will be a bit trickier because uh, we no longer have the, the SPQR tree that displays all these low order separations, but you could try to use something like the tree of tangles. Um, so, uh, so for example, we prove that this conjecture is true uh, if H is a tree. So we proved this uh, last week, actually. Uh, so this conjecture is true if H uh, is a tree and uh, it would be nice if it was true uh, in general. So let me finish with, okay, with, with a couple other uh, open problems. Um, okay, maybe we can kind of skip this slide, but uh, uh, right, so this is basically about homomorphism inequality. So this notation means the number of copies of this graph in G. And, um, and so this is actually some homomorphism inequality that's true for, for all graphs. So it turns out that for every graph, if I count the number of vertices and I multiply that by the number of triangles, it's at most that, that guy. 
Uh, and there are kind of analogous uh, homomorphism inequalities on surfaces, um, which you can get from Euler's formula. So I've called this Goodman's theorem on surfaces. Uh, so for example, this thing you can use to prove um, Mantel's theorem, which is the, which is the triangle version of, of Turan's theorem. Uh, so our question is, um, is there kind of a flag algebra method? So this is sort of a machinery developed by Rasborov that allows you to kind of prove these homomorphism inequalities with a computer. Uh, is there a flag algebra machinery that works um, in minor closed classes? Uh, that's the first open problem. And the, the second open problem is, um, can you decide uh, homomorphism inequalities in minor closed classes? Um, so there's a nice result of, of Sergei Norin and, and Hamid Hatami that says that um, in general, uh, this, this is undecidable. Um, so it's, uh, it's undecidable um, uh, to test the validity of a, of a linear, even a linear homomorphism inequality. Um, so there's no algorithm that does this, but maybe there are algorithms if you restrict to, um, to minor closed classes. So I guess I will finish there. Uh, thank you for your time attention. Thank you, Tony. Uh, so I'll have a moment for questions here, then I'll stop the recording in a uh, minute for any additional questions. Well, it, I looks, guess Go it looks to me, uh, if, if I fix the embedding of H, and I'm counting copies with a fixed embed of a given embedding, instead of a given graph, I count copies of a given embedding. Um, and mm -hmm. by embedding, I, I, I guess I just want to, want to tell you like locally how it looks. And, um, but it looks to me like your proof would give the same bounds, like the same, same polynomials. Cause you're not, you're not doing flipping. You're just shifting. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that should, that should work. I think, yeah. All right. I'll uh, go ahead and stop the recording.